Welcome back to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen. I'm your host, Kristen Saxena. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about school lunches, specifically healthier school lunches. I recently had the opportunity to visit my alma mater, my old high school. And as part of that visit, I got to enjoy school lunch. Um, it was not the school lunch that I remembered from the days when I was there long ago. Uh, instead, they have made many changes to their school lunch program, including making the lunches healthier, environmentally sustainable, and actually even vegetarian and plant-based. I was blown away by how delicious um, the number, the amount of food that I was given um, and the way that they were able to pull this off um, and feed an entire school. So I'm very excited to have our guests today, Jackie Coniglia and Scott Quinn, join us to talk about how you and all of us can make school lunches healthier and to answer some of your questions. Welcome to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen, where we help you navigate the challenges of feeding your family and learn about the role food plays in our health and relationships. Feeding and food relationships can be stressful, confusing, and even destructive. I'm Kristen Saxena, a pediatrician and mother of four who's been researching and sharing what I've learned about feeding for over 10 years. In this podcast, I'll share my experience and expertise to help our kids and ourselves with everyday survival tips for real parents. This podcast is about progress, not perfection. So let's get started. Well, I am joined today uh, by the masterminds behind a very highly unique and innovative school lunch program, uh, Scott Quinn and Jackie Coniglia. Uh, you're kind of in charge of the program, right? Jackie's in charge. And Jackie's I help in out. charge. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're you're the program director. Yeah. I okay. Am. And Scott, you. Yeah, I help out. I'm there a lot. I do some other things at the school as well. But um, yeah, I, I get to be there a lot in the mornings and learn. Perfect. And you're you're also a teacher. Yep, I'm a teacher at Duchenne. Um, so I do some campus ministry work there. Um, I teach a class called Finding God in All Foods. It's a culinary arts theology elective. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I help run the garden program. So we we try and incorporate some of the food that we grow on site there. And then yeah, I work in the kitchen a little bit. Amazing. And then Jack, you are like behind a lot of the recipes and or yes, you tell me. Um, recipes and menus and ordering and cooking and and organizing and things like that. But Scott's, you know, uh, in there with me big time. So it wouldn't really be happening without him, even though he's <laughs> being casual about it. But it's a team. It's a good it's team. It's definitely a team. team but you effort. guys are basically like. I mean, I know you have students and lots of help, but it sounds like you two are the, the backbone yes, of yes, this program. Yes, we yep, are. Yep, yep. Yep. Okay, so I think we should mention, I mean, it's a very small school, so how many how many kids go to Duchenne these days? 340, I think, is the count. Yeah, we've probably got 340, and then we serve the faculty as well, Phil's faculty and staff, so we probably have another 80 that are there. And then I would say probably about... A third of all that population is taking lunch on any given day. It depends, you know, what the lunch is and all those types of things. But sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you guys um, just describe, because this is a very unique unique program, I would say. Um, can you describe a little bit about what's so different about the lunch program at Duchenne versus maybe what people are kind of used to seeing as the typical school lunch for their kids? Sure. Um, well, I guess for starters, we cook from scratch. Uh, that was something that we, um, you know, felt strongly about, and I don't think we'd be doing if that wasn't the intention. So we do that. Um, currently, we have a vegetarian menu, um, so that's definitely something different in Omaha, and a challenge at all times, but um, uh, something that we do. Uh, we also compost everything, so. Um, Again, something. I mean, I might not be doing it if if I if we didn't have the composting and the sustainable aspect of it. We have a huge garden, and we source from our garden a fair amount, as much as we can, and um, we source uh, locally as well, and then um, traditional um, things too. We we also have uh, it's community driven I would say so we have teachers that will jump in and help out we have parents that help out we have students um, 
that help out in different capacities. So um, that I think that's a unique aspect that we really enjoy. Yeah. yeah, I think I would add to that too, something more, you know, when I'm thinking back to my grade school experience and what lunches were like and stuff that, you know, we really are focused on the student or the adult, but in serving them. And so, you know, you come get the food that you want and if you want to come back for more, you can come get more and we're not going to charge you more. The focus isn't really on that. The focus is on presenting food as a fun, enjoyable experience. And, you know, we, we, we try and throw in some new things being an all vegetarian menu. There's sometimes you have to be creative or introduce some new things that kids haven't heard of before. And, and so that's certainly fun. And we found really the, the best way to do that is getting them involved in the cooking process. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of student involvement, I think, that's going on that you probably wouldn't be seeing in some other schools. I think that's very cool. And, you know, I went to Duchenne. I graduated long ago. Um, and this is definitely, I remember the school lunches there being good, like tasty in that sense. And I feel like they were, they were like people's moms that made them. And so maybe they had a little bit more of a, like a homemade touch than like your average school lunch or the school lunches I remember from elementary school, which were more like, you know, everybody remembers like the rectangle pizza pizza and mm -hmm. all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly was like, not scratch cooked, certainly not vegetarian. And for whatever reason, the thing I remember most is just like drinking a lot of red Kool-Aid or some sort of red punch. Uh, I feel like that may have lasted a long time, but or maybe it's still there. I don't know. Um, but like, when did when did this change really come about? Well, this is our fourth year, right? Yep. So um, and uh, one of the ladies who did run the lunch program for a while still works with us a little bit, Nancy Davis. Oh, good. So well, you can really tell great. her that I really actually enjoyed lunch. <laughs> the girls love <laughs> Nancy's lunches, so um, it's great to have her yeah. still be a part of it. Um, but um, I think they, Nancy was getting ready to retire, and Scott, super interested in food, and knew that I had a culinary um, background and approached me about starting it. So... Um, so we just kind of fumbled into it, I feel like, a yeah. little bit. Yeah. yeah. And we both, um, you know, definitely had a passion for gardening, um, also for cooking from scratch. So we've, uh, this is our fourth year. Of okay. It, so we're just kind of making our way through and learning as we go, um, trying to change things and, uh, so that it's more welcoming to the students and the community. Um, Yeah. And what, what would you say have been like, obviously starting something new like that, and like you said, you kind of have to learn a little bit as you go when you sort of start something new from scratch. So what, what have been like the big lessons that you feel like you've learned over these last four years? Sure, uh, well, I think one thing is that the kids want familiar food. Um, you know, they want something that they recognize and um, know that they like, and they're a little bit more hesitant to try things that are, as an adult, might sound good, but maybe it's, you know, just a little too far out there for the kids. Um, go, go yeah, I, I would say, too, uh, you know, in line with that, we've learned it's a hard challenge to try and balance cooking food that both students and adults are going to like. We're trying mm -hmm. to cover a lot of palates, and so... We, learning to be creative and how to do that and, and giving choice and options and how that can sometimes really help and do that. But also that anyone, but students in particular, take more pride and more desire to eat the food if they've cooked it themselves. So when we have the students cooking in lunch, whether through my class or just through work study or they're helping out in the morning or whatever it is, that if they're the one that, you know, cubed that tofu in the morning, they're going to they're gonna make their friends eat it. And even if this is disgusting, but eat it. I made it. There's energy and there's excitement there because they did something and they're proud of it. And that is really a strong point uh, of bringing people together and bringing people to food is getting involved in that preparation. And that's why that scratch cooking is so important to us because that that's where a lot of the buy-in comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the things you mentioned are, are issues for you guys in serving that school lunch, but things like preparing food that both the adults and kids want to eat and getting kids involved in preparing food. I think those, even if you're a little bit out of control about what's going on at your school, um, those are all things that everybody deals with. I think all parents deal with at home too. So I think it's very relatable. And so it's very cool to hear from you guys. I mean, you guys have to kind of take that on on a little bit larger scale, but it's super interesting to hear from you guys, how you guys are, 
are making that work, essentially. So I think that's really cool. Um, another question I had was sort of what was, what were your big, I know these were kind of areas of interest for you guys, but what was the big motivators for making this change at Duchenne for you or maybe for the school in general? I think for me it was kind of almost a little bit of, of a justice issue of sorts, but that, you know, food's something we're going to be eating multiple times a day and where it's sourced from and how it's made and how it's packaged and prepared and then potentially thrown away, hopefully not, but that, that, that's been the big driver for me and where I've seen a lot of joy and success in what we've done, you know, and Jackie mentioned we compost, but beyond that, I mean, we're, we're using or reusing virtually everything. So it's more than just composting and it's, we do wash plates every time and we're not going to be using any, if we do use some quote unquote disposables, they are compostable. So it's that, that component piece of really, this is a way of working with the earth that is respectful of the gifts that it has given us and the fruits and the, you know, all these types of things. That's kind of, that's been the big piece for me and why we have a big garden and all that other mm -hmm. stuff, right? Is this, this direct connection to, to the environment, to life in general, that's bigger than us. Mm hmm yeah, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. It's definitely the sustainability aspect is um, a huge part of it and a huge drive and, um, you know, makes it uh, makes the challenge worth it to me. Um, also, just trying to maybe open people's eyes to uh, eating for the environment somewhat and how that has such a positive benefit to everyone. Um, so uh, that would be another aspect. And what has been the response of the students? Like, do you feel like um, they've been pretty good at making that connection? I mean, I'm sure it varies person to person, mm -hmm. but do you feel like, you know, over time and kind of um, that you've had the ability to sort of explain the whys behind a lot of the things that you're doing or why this is different? Um, like what kind of feedback or responses have you got from them? Uh, well, you probably have a better idea of that, Scott, because I'm usually sure. down in the kitchen and you're up and can hear a little more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we have yeah. the nicest students on the planet. And so sometimes when you're in it, it's hard to get accurate feedback. But overall, and we certainly do get some some critiques, too. I mean, I think they have a lot of nice things to say. They certainly buy into the sustainability piece. I think um, the most pushback we probably get is on the being completely vegetarian. I mm -hmm. think that's a new experience for a lot of people and you know our reason for kind of getting into that was it's not a lifestyle change we're pushing long term on anybody but this is this is one meal a day mm -hmm. that's probably a harder meal to prepare for most people so let's let us do that we're comfortable we know how to do that it's fun and exciting for us so then you know the other meals you, you can do some other things so that's um, been a little pushback but again it's just how are we approaching and if we're going to be invitational and in my class, for example, we we do family meal every week where they bring a recipe from their families that they can prepare. And sometimes we'll need to tweak it as what we have in the kitchen available. But that that's the way that if you can bridge those gaps a little bit and kind of more come towards the center on both parties, it's helpful. Yeah. And I mean, I think that, that that's worth saying. Like we're in Nebraska, which is like, you know, meat headquarters as far as I can tell. Yes. Um, yeah. And certainly like... You know, I, I was raised eating plenty of meat, and I think that's sort of more the culture, I guess, of, in terms of where we live. So I assume that, like you said, it is, for some people in particular, like a rather big shift from how they're used to eating. Um, but I liked the way you said it in the sense, like, we're not necessarily trying to push this as that this is the way you should eat all the time or this is the correct way of doing things. Um, more so, like, using it as an opportunity for exposure to that and also explaining to the kids and probably the parents as well why you know this has lots of benefits in terms of health but also like the environment even just changing one meal a day even if it's you know five times a week mm -hmm. uh, you can make a positive impact and to me it's like you guys are setting the example like well especially if you're not used to this or eating this way we're already we're going to give you exposure and examples of ways that you can do this and i think it's also worth mentioning that you do this in like not a commercial kitchen <laughs> you i mean you do this as far as i can tell there's like a, a microwave a sink and a countertop or something which i know is not exactly true but i mean you aren't necessarily doing anything that's going to require 
things that these kids are not going to have access to in yeah, the future. Yeah, I lovingly refer to it as a hodgepodge kitchen, um, which is great. You know, we've we, and I also say that we uh, do what we can with what we have. Mm-hmm. So down the road, there are plans for a bigger kitchen. But yeah, we have. Um, Con- convec- or conduction burner tops and we've got one oven and um you know a couple fridges and so we we just um, make it work in kind of and you know not a perfect space but it's okay we we know the quirks and and we're figuring it out and as and as an educational program in some ways it's almost a little more ideal because as these students many of whom will likely go to college this is going to be their cooking experience in college in most places, you know, maybe or maybe not you have a stovetop and you have an oven that you share with everyone. And, you know, so the the types of food preparations that we're doing and the things that we're cooking. And yes, there's, there's lots of different reasons for, for the vegetarian, but a huge one too is the practical of food safe and storage space and cooking time and all, you know, venting, you know, all of that other technical stuff that any of the things that we're making, you can go to college and make pretty easily if you've got an oven because that, that's basically all we have. So it's it works nice there as well, actually. Mm-hmm. And have you got like significant pushback from any of the parents or anything that feel like you know this this their children won't eat this meal or that they don't feel like it's good for their child or anything? Sure. Like that? Yes. Parents have expressed that concern, and, and we understand that. I mean, uh, you know, foods really personal and it, depending on how you're brought up and things you know you might not be aware that we can satisfy a nutritional needs without meat um so we definitely understand that and and try to address um parents uh one big thing was you know people often worry about protein content so um we did kind of put up a page just about the protein content of the meals. Um, we always like to stress that we have a lot of options for the girls to kind of expand on what they're eating um, to make sure that they're full. And we also, um, you know, invite parents to come down and they're not always able to um, take us up on that. But, you know, if you're uh, unhappy with it or if you're, you know, don't understand it, then come on down and maybe serve lunch with us or come down and have lunch with your child and just kind of see what's going on, give you a better idea. Um, like Scott said, we're not pushing a, a lifestyle on anyone. We are doing the best we can with what we have and doing something that, you know, we we feel good about and we feel like is wholesome mm-hmm. and welcoming to the students. So, um, so we try to address that in a, you know, an understanding and welcoming way. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I came and visited and had your lunch and it was, I mean, leaps and bounds above anything I ever ate for school lunch oh, in my whole life. Nice. Um, and I'm not just saying that, like I went and exactly true. It was, and I, I am not a vegetarian person, but that was more than enough food. And I'm an eater. So it was more than enough food, very filling. And I would say, um, maybe owing to your culinary background, but it was basically just restaurant quality food. Oh, that's um, nice. It really was. <laughs> and so I think, you know, it's amazing because I think on, on the flip side, you know, you have, if you're sort of presenting this as, you know, this is the way you can eat vegetarian and instead you're sort of left with like bland, boring food that might create the impression to people, well, like this eating like this is no fun. Yeah. Um, but that is certainly not the experience that I had. Oh, like to we like, do, we so you do it well, fun and we, mm-hmm. you know, try like color really kind of matters. You know, yeah. so, you know, colorful plates and colorful options, I think, is helpful in um, trying to offer a little bit of a variety. So things that are familiar, but maybe you know, we try to add something in there that a student hasn't tried before. So, um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, well, questions I had too were: Is there a dish that was surprisingly well received by the students? One that you were kind of like, eh, and then everyone loved it. Hmm, or on the flip side, good. maybe is there one that was like a total flop, and you were like, <laughs> "Nope, not going to bring that one." Yeah, yeah. this is funny. <laughs> yeah, we um because if we have a lot of extras, we'll pack them up and put them out on a cold cart, and then the girls can have them after school. So um, that food is always gone except the day that we had chili. And then I heard 
a student go by, yeah, it's chilly. You know? So, you know, I kind of just took that off the menu because if they, they really don't want it, then I, you know, we're not, we don't want to force them to eat it. But, um, but that was surprising. I thought everyone loved a version of chili that wasn't, you know, too out there. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Yeah. I think the one that they, and maybe I'm just going to speak for myself here and ignore what everyone else actually thinks, but I'm just speaking this into the world to make it true. But we, we do this uh, cauliflower taco dish, and it's my absolute favorite, and it's the best. And they're always skeptical of it because, I don't know, people are just skeptical of cauliflower. That's why, I suppose. And when we made it in class, though, all the students loved it. They thought it was super great. So we said, hey, let's try it and put it on the menu. We put it on the menu. I don't think a ton of students necessarily got it, but I did hear in the halls, those students who had made it before, you have to get lunch today. You're not going to think it's good, but I guarantee you, like, this is so good, you know, and all those students who made it got lunch who they weren't all lunch goers normally. So I, I think that that's one. It's it's a surprising one that they don't know they love it until they try it. I love that. Well, yeah. and I think to me that has always been, I always feel like school lunch has in America has often been this, like, sort of missed opportunity for a lot of things. And I think that speaks to one of those points is that, being in that environment with your peers, like sometimes if your parents or your teachers tell you like, oh, you should try this, you should do this, and especially maybe when you're in your early teen years, you're kind of like, whatever, you know, yeah. I don't do that, no thanks. But when you're with your peers and they tell you that, I think that's a special kind of influence. Um, but even for younger kids, when you see kids or your peers eating things around you that maybe you normally wouldn't, I think you're more apt to try it in that kind of environment. And so I think that that exactly is right. It's probably something that people would have been maybe a little bit skeptical of, but when your friends are like, no, trust me, this is going to be great. Um, that's one positive form of like yeah. <laughs> peer pressure maybe exactly. that, that actually can be beneficial. We're living with my in-laws right now, which is awesome. And one of the great things it's done for us, we have two little kids. And so when we sit down to have family meals, and I, I know you all talk a lot about the importance on here, which I would certainly echo, but my in-laws are much better at I, you know, oh, this food is so good. You, they just talk more and oh, this is so great and all this. And I have seen the dramatic shift from before when it was just my wife and I and we are just struggling to get through a meal right now. We have two more adults, so we're kind of have extra reinforcements here and they can talk about how tasty the food is. And there has been my five-year-old now she's like, Oh, I want to try that. Or the other day she, she started crying cause she was like, I wish I would have helped make dinner cause it's so good. You know that yeah. she has that energy and this was not something that she would have liked before. But now when she hears the mm -hmm. other people talking about it and even they're 70 years older than her, but she, you know, it's that community that, brings people into the excitement or the desire or the trying something new or all of that stuff, that community is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, I think, one of the things that's really cool about having this sort of lunch program that may be different from the way that a lot of people eat at home is it just provides that exposure and normalizes and creates a comfort level with just a different way of eating or living, um, whether they choose to adopt that to a large degree, small degree or not at all, nonetheless, it won't seem foreign or strange. Um, and I think that no matter what, that that's beneficial in just sort of the entire education of the person as they grow. So I think it's really cool that you guys are doing that. Um, and I have to ask because I really need to know more about this class that you're teaching and I'm like devastated that this didn't exist when I was in school. Sure. Yeah. So um, basically I was doing my student teaching at Duchenne and then when it was done, I said, oh, I need to find a way to give these re people some reason to hire me. So I said, I'll teach the kids how to cook. And they said, great, do that. And I said, I should probably go to culinary school. So I started this class with no real background. I mean, I, I've cooked in places before, but and then started this class. It's, it's called Finding God in All Foods. So it's a culinary arts theology elective course. We have about eight students. And it's changed every semester on what we do. And especially with COVID, things continue to change, certainly. And so as it stands now, we usually have a group, uh, a partner of students who make family meal. So again, this idea, right, they're going to cook a meal and you'd see it in restaurant kitchens and other things too. But there's two people that are going to prepare food for the rest of the class and the people that are working. And then the other students kind of work with Jackie and myself to prepare the lunch for the rest of the school, that they're involved directly in that, whether it's making the cookie dough and scooping the cookies or chopping vegetables or, you know, whatever it is. And on the way, they're learning 
skills of how to actually cook food and how to hold a knife and how to do all these types of things. So it's it's been a nice way to get them involved with this small community of a class, but their bigger community of a whole school. And they'll help in the garden when the season's right and all those types of things too. Mm -hmm. And so then what are like the, do you have like a specific lessons that accompany sort of the food preparation process? And are they more like culinary skill lessons or are they more sort of philosophical? Yeah, so kind of I'm, in in the cooking world there's like cooks and there's cooking and there's baking typically and cook cooking is more loosey-goosey you can kind of change it as you go that's kind of more me jackie does the baking and probably gets frustrated with me often when i'm more loosey-goosey no and i so, totally understand that i'm a cook i'm not a baker yeah i, I know it. it's that's why she's running it and i just kind of <laughs> mess things up no i i help out um but so i i have general ideas of spirits that I want to accomplish of, I want cooking to be fun. I want this to be creative. I want it to be community building. And at a place where you're always going and taking tests and you have stress and all these types of things, I want it to not be that. Essentially, Mm -hmm. those are my main lessons that I want to somehow weave into everything. And so, you know, on the first day of class this semester, I said, here's what you're all doing. Go with no real further instructions. And they said, what? what? Like, how do we do this? And I'm like, no, this is the whole point. And in cooking, whether it's at school or at home, it's okay to make a few mistakes and get back to that. You'll be okay. And so those, those are the lessons. There's some philosophical lessons we do outside of the class or on dashboard or get into boring education stuff. But um, yeah, those are the main kind of culinary lessons we're getting at. And have you had any, I just think that kind of class, it would be very interesting to me, just sort of, I'm sure there's very interesting observations that you make uh, about the students, probably throughout the course of the course. Yeah. Um, But what has kind of been your observation? I mean, do they come in usually? Obviously, it's an elective, so that probably, you know, you get certain students with certain interests, either that they want these skills or they're already interested in these skills. I don't know. But what's kind of been your your observations as the teacher? We've seen the gamut of people that are really skilled. So last semester we had someone who could have probably taught the course and she loved baking and I I sent her more to Jackie to do some of that stuff. So we've certainly had some. And then we have others that say, I legitimately don't know how to use a vegetable peeler. You know, I've never, I've never used one before. I don't know how to use this. And so that's a super rewarding experience to really be saying, oh, I'm, I'm helping teach this kid to cook for the first time. I mean, that's pretty exciting and cool. Mm Mm-hmm. You also see um, the student that Scott's talking about. Uh, it's really neat to see the students mentor other students, um, and I think that's a great aspect of your class too. Yeah, and you get to see something that's probably not the most, you know, you know the kids who are good at math at school, and you know the kids who are good at whatever, or even sports, but this is a potentially more niche area where if someone can demonstrate their skills and other people can recognize them for it. It's a really, it's a really cool experience for them as well. That is awesome. And so, and so what will happen, like to make sure I understand it right, is a couple of kids every week or? Yeah, twice a week. Twice Mm -hmm. a week. Well, it will be their day to create this meal. And so they bring a recipe usually from their family that their family eats. Yeah. So we, we change it every semester and how it looks, but yeah, essentially they'll, at the beginning of the semester, they'll all bring a recipe and I'll help tweak it to make sure it's can be cooked in our kitchen or whatever. And then it's like, yeah, you're, you're the lead on this. Find a friend, find a partner and help walk them through it. Maybe, maybe they don't know how to do it either. Maybe they've never cooked it. Mostly they've never cooked it, but you know, they want to know how to make their great grandma's spaghetti. It's like, well, here's your opportunity to figure out and read a recipe and work through it with a friend. And, um, and yeah, then the rest are kind of working with Jackie to actually get lunch ready to go. Very cool. And do any of these recipes like then make the menu? That would be, I feel like, you know, that would have been my goal all along. I would have, (laughs) I'd be like, I'm going to bring the one that's going to make the school. Yeah. That's so great. Uh, I don't think they have so far, but, you know, we're always open to that. So, yeah, a little Um, competition is in order, I think, maybe. But, you know, and certainly they've got just a lot of different, for some reason, everyone really loves these chocolate chip cookies that we make. They're like infamous. Yeah, I don't know. But so the students like bringing a lot of different cookie recipes, but I think if we if we had a different cookie once, I think 
the, someone would pull the fire alarm. It, they would go crazy. So some things just have to stay, I think. Understood. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was how you, you said you incorporate the students. I mean, obviously through this class. Um, but are there what other ways are you getting? Because there's only, you said, about eight girls in this class. So are there other ways that you're incorporating sort of the student body into the lunch program, the gardens? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one big way uh, is our work study students. Um, so we have an opportunity for them um, to work in the kitchen and um, they develop a lot of skills and we come to rely on them quite a bit. And I think they learn a lot and, um, uh, are, you know, it's, it's a really a beneficial arrangement for all of us. Um, so that's a big way. Another way too, it doesn't happen all the time, but occasionally, and it, it, if there's some celebration uh, of that month of, you know, Hispanic Awareness Month or some sort of whatever the case may be, that we might have a family that owns a restaurant or just is a family that loves to cook. And so then they, you know, their mom and their grandma and them and a few of their friends might prepare the meal that day and will be there to assist them or get out of the way or whatever they want. And then that's another way that we're we're not only getting the students involved, but really we're getting their whole families involved or their whole, you know, kind of their own little community involved as well, which we've done a few of those this year. And that that was super rewarding for us, for me. Yeah, me too. It was great. Um, so obviously Duchenne is a relatively small school and it's private school, which kind of gives you guys a little bit more leeway in terms of being able to be nimble and make changes on a maybe faster pace than you might be able to do in a larger like public school setting um but if there's one thing like if you had the ability to like kind of advise maybe a larger school system like what's a change that we could make because obviously they're facing things let's say a lot of the same issues you guys are in terms of um, finances, um, availability of kitchen space. I know not all public schools have their own kitchens and they're kind of reliant on like a central kitchen. Um, and then just, you know, feedback from parents and and students. And I think having to sell a certain amount of lunches to make lunches available, um, you know, free and reduced lunches. Oh, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. But as you, I'm sure you've given some thought kind of being in the space and thinking about it, like, what do you think, what would be your advice, I guess? Well, I would say uh, that s starting small and, you know, picking something that you can really focus on that you maybe you want to make a change or you want to add or see happen or increase your involvement. Um, so, you know, picking maybe one aspect of your program, maybe a, a small garden and really thinking about what you're gonna put in there so that you can utilize it. Or maybe there's just one thing that you wanna offer with your lunch that you know you're going to make from scratch and that you can you know put it out there. So I, I think like picking one thing, dedicating yourself to that, something doable and um, you know getting that in the motion and then I think you find that when you get started that uh, more and more happens along the way and it, it's, I don't want to say easier, but in some ways, you, you know, you get people on board, people interested that want to help um, you figure things out and understand better how better it works or what works or what you can do with your time and your space and your money and everything. So um, you kind of become inspired when something works and and find a way to add to that so maybe you want to add like a homemade soup every day you know that's something mm -hmm. that's pretty doable you got a couple pots you know you can um be really flexible with your ingredients and it's something that you could probably commit to and uh once that gets going then you can look to me the next thing how you want to add on to that mm -hmm. that would be my suggestion yeah, I, I, I was going to say nearly the exact same thing of, of starting small and picking one thing. You know, when we started the program four years ago, it wasn't vegetarian when we started. And that was something that came in over time. And the sustainability, all the things are things that we slowly kind of added in. So and in addition, you know, when you're thinking about that, what that one thing is that you want to add, because I think all educators out there and all school staff, and you know, they want the best, healthiest things for their kids and they, they their heart's in the right place of 
whatever that one thing is, make sure it's something that you are excited about or you are passionate about because it is going to inevitably take some extra time of yours that you're probably not going to get paid for. I mean, if we're just being honest, you know, I mean, you're going to have to stay a little extra to sort through the trash if that's your thing, or you're going to have to stay a little extra to make that home, whatever it is Mm -hmm. that if it's something that you enjoy and you, you love and that you want to go home and then go do it home anyways on your free time, right? Like that's something that you're going to be willing to do for these students who you also love. So, so making sure that you start there. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, well, I do want to move on to like the next segment of our podcast, which you guys may or may not be familiar with, but it's the ask me anything portion. Um, so I have a question from Sam and this one, actually, I'm really interested to hear from you guys because as, um, school lunch leaders, as well as parents, how I would say, did you or will you approach school lunches with your own kids? Because actually, you have older children, right? I do, yeah. And how old are your kids? Uh, gosh, 22 and 24. 22 and yep. 24, and then you have little kids. Yeah, they're five and two. Five and two. So I feel like we're like past school lunch and like just gonna get into that. Exactly. Yep. So how, and granted, I mean, I don't know, maybe like, Life has changed for you as well. I'm sure all of us grow and change over time. But how did you approach school lunches when your girls were in school? Uh, Yeah, well, I packed lunches all the Mm -hmm. time. Um, Actually, I I got my start a little bit at a little Montessori that my kids worked at, and I did lunch for them one day a week. And um, so I saw a lot of what was going on, and they didn't um, have a daily regular lunch program as it was. So... Um, so I was just used to packing lunches and, um, also we're big on leftovers in my house. So, you know, we'd make use of leftovers and things like that. So honestly, I really packed lunches pretty much all through school, unless there was a day when, you know, they really, there's something that they really wanted or, um, my kids have both been raised vegetarian as well. So there's another little aspect that's kind of different in most of the school systems. And that was just a way of um, making sure they got something healthy and I knew they would eat it and it would be fulfilling. Um, so so that probably doesn't help a parent who's wondering. No, not at all, about because I think that that's always the question because, yeah. I mean, at least to me, I'm always torn because um, on the one hand, you know, it's nice to have the control of, uh, packing the lunch, right? Like I know exactly what's in it. Um, especially if you feel like the, the lunch that they're getting at school is questionable from a nutritional standpoint. Um, or if you have a picky eater that you're afraid they're not going to eat anything. And so you pack the foods that you know that they'll eat, but it's also to me a double-edged sword because of all the opportunities that come with school lunch in the sense of, Again, like, you know, if I if I know these are the four things that you will eat at lunch and then, you know, you get in the habit of being like, well, this is the same stuff you eat every day because and it's sort of reinforcing sometimes sort of those picky eating type oh, habits yeah. as opposed to, you know, at school, that sort of communal experience where maybe, you know, they're going to try something they wouldn't try otherwise because, you know, their friend Joey who sits next to them is eating it today or whatever. Um, so I think that that's actually a real I mean, it's a real thing that every parent addresses probably yeah. um, on that standpoint. So do you, you felt like your motivations were mostly, I mean, uh, well, out of necessity and, when they were young, because yeah. there wasn't a, a program. And then as they got older, um, yeah, I mean, part of it was like, let's use up these leftovers. You yeah, know? I mean, economically and, um, at least I knew and, what they were eating and um, uh yeah, I guess I I don't know how else to explain it. But yeah, I just wasn't so sure about some of the lunches and, and you know, what kind of things they would eat from it. So yeah. I just it was a healthier perspective for me to know that they were. Would, Did they usually mm. go like along with it? Because I always feel like, you know, no matter what I would do, if we were in like making lunch mode or buying lunch mode, w- one of my kids will always be like, ah. Oh! You know, can't I just get school lunch? Or they're like, can't I just bring my lunch? No matter what it is, you know, the grass is always greener kind of deal. (laughs) My kids are pretty good. They're pretty good eaters. And um, uh, I I probably (laughs) overthought it like I do often (laughs) with food. So, um, you know, I knew that they would have what they needed and they didn't. And if there was something that they really wanted to get, that was fine. But uh, yeah, so that's just how it worked for us. 
but Scott's in a different yeah, position I, now. I'm He's just about to approach that. You're just so. getting into it. So. Yeah, so we have one that's getting lunches now, and it's also lunch is free for everyone right now, so that's another little changing yeah. component. And um, so as it is now, yeah, so we we just let her pick if she wants the lunch or, or not or whatever. A lot of times when she's getting lunch, I die a little bit on the inside because I it is not what I would be packing mm-hmm. or serving mm-hmm. or something like that. But for kind of what you said, for that element of the community piece, she gets to eat and do stuff with her friends. Um, I also, because they're making a lot of things I would never make. I mean, she's trying new stuff, which that is a that is a bigger picture. That's something that I want to encourage of trying mm-hmm. new foods. You know, those aren't those aren't the new foods that I'm going to be cooking. But it's still this idea of trying new food, be willing to be open. And some of them she likes and some of them she doesn't. So we can we can decompress afterwards. Um, I think the hardest thing is when she takes school lunch, for my wife at least, we don't get to send a note in the school, you know, oh, on this lunch yeah. every day. And so <laughs> I think that sometimes she wants us to have home lunch because she gets notes. So um, <laughs> there's that component, right? You got to you gotta get the notes in. Those are but, the best. We used to write like um, jokes or like facts interesting facts yeah she's she's just starting to learn how to read so there's a lot of like pictures with a few words or two yeah so that's been fun but yeah as it is we kind of let her pick we just you know that idea of trying to give some autonomy and freedom they don't have that a lot in their lives when they're Mm -hmm. little so the few options when they can um we're trying to get that and then you know the the other piece of that is too that I am, we're working with a community that is talking to the school. Are there ways we can change or reform or whatever? I don't, if I have issues with the school lunch program, I'm not just being grumpy and not eating it or being grumpy and eating it. I'm also politely and to the degree that I can, hey, how can we help? Because they probably have similar desires as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I kind of had the similar experience, like the, the school that my kids go to, they've now switched to um, Flick Dining Service, which Mm. you guys Mm -hmm. probably have heard of. Um, Certainly not like as like uh, sustainable and like, um, you know, it's not vegetarian or anything of that nature, but but also on the flip side, um, to me was a really big improvement uh, in terms of like scratch cooked and they try to do like local sourcing. I think it was a step up, I Mm -hmm. think, from the typical school meals that we had been used to. Um, and for me, that gave me a lot of comfort to move more towards the school lunches. Um, I will say as the parent, once you get into that, you're like, oh, this is a sweet deal. Like I finally just made it like an across the board this year that I was like, everybody gets school lunch every day. Um, and But before that, we were kind of doing some more of this balance thing because I wanted them to have the benefit of, you know, that community aspect mm-hmm. and trying new things. And so it would kind of be like, you know, a couple of meals are from home and a couple of meals are from school. And that was sort of my way of balancing out. But um, I feel fortunate. And I think that the girls that you guys are serving are extremely fortunate to have that option where I can feel like decent or good about what they're eating um, and then allow them to have that opportunity to go and and sort of try new things and eat the same food as the people around them. Um, and I've actually been surprised because I mean, my kids are pretty varied eaters, and obviously, like, we're into food and all those things at home, but, like, I have a 13-year-old son, and um, it's, like, a really big deal, like, the salad bar and soup. Like, you wouldn't think, like, you know, he's, like, bigger than me, you know, all these things, and so you think, oh, you know, he's going to, that's who you think is going and looking for, like, the hot dogs and cheeseburgers every day, and he loves all those things. But he's like, yeah, every day I just get salad and soup every day. And I'm like, great. Really? So I think he... When you allow kids to just have that option and like be free, they actually end up a lot of times, I think, making good choices, but it's sort of in, well, this is actually, isn't this is like a, I'm going to say it wrong, but it's like one of those things I learned from Duchenne. It's like choices in wise freedom, right? Yeah, you said you it right. Better, yeah, right? See, right. I learned something while I was there. <laughs> but that's exactly what I think of as the situation where it's like, you can't fail hard, yeah. right? It's yeah. just school lunch. Um, you can't destroy anything but giving them those options they actually usually do pretty well um when they're left to their own devices yeah we used to have a a sign up so we'd have on a paper and they would like circle the lunch that they wanted for the month i mean that was just a nightmare to kind of keep track of but i think i actually did that too wait a that was a whole process but you know as far as parents are concerned i guess it's a good way you know for them to say like hey let's you know tonight we're going to take like five minutes and look at the menu and why don't you tell me like what sounds good and what you don't want so that might be just a good way 
and uh, and you don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but it gives the parent an idea of what your kid wants to eat, and also like, am I going to have to have things for a cold lunch, you know, today? So mm-hmm. you know, just looking ahead at the at the menu and um, asking your child about what what they might want and and you know what they'll eat. So um, that's probably a good way to go about it. Yeah. I have one more question from Felix, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, but it is, what do you think is the single biggest problem with the way that we approach school lunches in America? Just end on a deep one. (laughs) I think that we in America have, and I have no scientific research to back, I have nothing, this is my own personal speaking, that there is this huge focus on nutrition as a very hard science and you know this tomato has so many whatever nutrition things that people nutritionists care about that um, qualifies it as a vegetable or a fruit or whatever it is and all these things and I think that as a result of that you know I I know a lot in, in the public schools you have to make sure you have a fruit and a vegetable and whatever on your plate and that dictates what you can cook and all these things. And we're fortunate that we don't have that and that freedom that it allows us to give some options to cook food that people like and to make lunch or whenever a less stressful time for everyone is, is just so much is that that is very helpful that I think that freedom, that wise freedom to allow people to, Maybe you don't know everyone's circumstance every day. It's just having that a little bit of freedom, I think, would would solve a lot of issues. Maybe not. Again, that's just me personally, but that's what mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is a great point. I think I probably agree with that. When you boil it down to like distinct numbers, having to you know fit a lunch into a, a certain number categories and hope that the kids will mm-hmm. you know fit into that as well. So I think that creates problems with. When you're cooking, it does take a little. It takes takes a lot of the creativity out of it. It adds anxiety and mm-hmm. stress for sure. And I th- think that comes out in food sometimes too. You know, we can see that when when it's um, pushed. But mm-hmm. you know, to just um, meet up with certain standards um, when maybe we should just be looking at a more wholesome time. You know, mm-hmm. we want your child to sit down and and ha- have the time to, to um, you know, have a, a wholesome meal. Mm-hmm. You know, and, w- and one of the lessons that I, that I tell a lot in my class is that when you're shopping for groceries, to shop on the peripheries of the store, right? To shop on those things that don't have nutrition labels because people can make labels very confusing and say what they want and advertisers and all that stuff. So that, that's just, you know, the more things that we can get that don't have labels, I think the better you're going to be. Very much. So. I think two things you said. Number one, I think that is a great point is the time factor. Um, I mean, across the board, I hear that from kids and parents that they're not given like time to eat lunch, even little kids. You know, it's I mean, especially for a little kid it takes a while. If you've eaten with your kids by the time you get them sat down and everything ready to be eaten, like it takes a while sometimes to get through those meals. And so I think that that factor I don't know how you plan that into a school day, but I think that that's been something almost universally I've heard from people is that they're just not, it's not given the time that probably it warrants. And then to me, like the biggest issue is not approaching it kind of in the way that you guys are as an extension of learning throughout the day. And so, I mean, if you look, Um, You know, I know in some other countries, it's a lot more student participation in the food preparation, um, cleanup, things like that. Um, It's not so independent, like this is my food and I'll take it and sit down and throw away my own things or whatever. It's a lot more communal. Um, And even just, you know, obviously COVID is probably not a time to start family style (laughs) eating and things like that. But even just having that sort of approach to it where this is like, a family meal with my school family, um, I think extends the the benefits that you can get from a meal um, and that we've talked about, about family meals and all those things. You can bring those things into school with, to me, more of just like a mindset or paradigm shift. I mean, you would have to change what you were doing a little bit, but even if you change the food zero, I think you could do a lot of those things and br- pretty easily bring so much more education and like life lessons into the lunchroom. Oh, absolutely. 
Well, any other words of wisdom before we sign off? Just cook more. The more you cook, the better it's going to be. It should be so fun. Cook with your family. Cook with your friends. It's, it's a good time. Sit down and eat with them, too. Absolutely. It makes a huge difference. I love it. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you for this very cool thing that you are doing. And thank you for joining us today and sharing all of your experiences and wisdom. And thanks to everybody for joining us for another episode of Feeding the Family. Make sure if you're enjoying our episodes, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you never miss one. And we'll see you all next Monday for a new episode.